I'm going to show a series of miniature games because uh, I think these games are easier to remember. And if you're going to memorize games, it's easy to remember games which are fairly short. And hopefully you can um, take some inspiration. There's a lot of cool openings which I'll show today. So the first game I want to show I played back many years ago. I was 15 years old and I was playing in the US Open. It's one of the biggest tournaments in the US and it was in Indianapolis. And I was having a really good tournament. Um, I was on one of the top boards in the last round. And in the ninth round, ninth and last round, I was playing Grandmaster John Fedorowicz. Anyone heard of him? Has anyone been across the street to the World Chess Hall of Fame? No. So John Fedorowicz is actually, um, I think, inducted into the US Chess Hall of Fame. And he was inducted into the Hall of Fame the day before I played him at the US Open. And um, it, was, it was actually a good time to play him because he had like this whole thing he had to go to the day before. And I think by the time we started the game, he was not in the right mindset to play chess. And I'll show you a picture before we get started of uh, this one person taking pictures of us as we were playing the game. So this is him, this is me. Uh, it was a very intense game. Uh, we both were sitting down thinking um, for, for most of the game. Um, but it was a very quick game. What's that? It was a classical game. Uh, at US Open, US Open games can go up to six hours. It was uh, two hours per player with a, an additional yeah, hour after move 40. Um, luckily. Yeah. Luckily, in this game, we didn't reach move 40. We reached move 16, and he resigned. So I'll show you how to beat a GM in 16 moves. Um, I was black, which is even harder to do if you're black against a GM to win quickly. But, um, but we'll see what happens. So d4, d5, c4, e6. Uh, Queen's Gambit declined, which I was expecting because um, I looked him up before the game. That's one thing you can do if you ever play a strong player or a grandmaster. You can look them up online and see what openings they play. And it's usually a good idea uh, if you have some idea of what your opponent plays before you actually play them so you're, uh, you're prepared of what you might get into. Uh, knight c3, knight f6, he takes, I take. So this is a queen's gambit declined exchange variation. Um, very popular opening among a lot of strong players. Yes? I'll just do this, something like I know. OK, you know, OK. Um, so we, uh, we continue, bishop g5. This is the main line. And in this position, black typically has two moves. Um, white already has a threat. White wants to take on f6 and kind of pressure the d5 pawn. If uh, bishop take f6, queen take f6, knight take d5 would be possible. So the two main moves for black in this position are bishop e7, breaking the pin, or the move that I played, c6. Solid move. Uh, he played e3, and I played bishop to f5. So so far, not too much eventful has happened. We're we're actually following mainline theory. And does anyone know this line or has seen this line before? Yeah, a few of you. Do you guys know uh, what is the main move for white in this position? Queen f3. Yeah, queen f3 is the main line, and I think there was a pretty well-known game. Uh, several months ago with Carlson and Carlson Kramnik, where uh, Carlson won a beautiful positional game after queen f3 with the idea bishop g6, take, 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 take. And it's an end game, or a queenless middle game, I guess you could say, where white has some, uh, some positional play against the double pawns. And this was probably a more practical and safer option for him, but I think because it was the last round and because he was playing someone much lower rated than him, I was 2100 at the time, he decided that he wouldn't want to try and beat me quickly. So he went a little bit crazy in this position and he played pawn g4. Very crazy move. The first question is, can black take the pawn on g4? No. A few people say no. Anyone think black can get away with bishop take g4? No. no. Bishop takes g4, loses tactically to what move? Queen takes Arjun. Bishop takes f6, yes. Um, 
Queen take g4 actually doesn't quite work for white because after knight take, uh, white is actually up a pawn here. So you have to take the knight first. And then if take, take, it's messy. But uh, take, take, white has won a piece. So the g4 pawn can't be taken, and I have to move my bishop again. But uh, the downside for white is he's expanded very early on the king side. And he's, he's weakened his king side to the point where it might not be safe for him to castle later on. So I calmly move back, play bishop to e6. And he plays h3, supporting g4. So h3, um, and this is kind of weird, because white has played g4, h3, and hasn't focused on developing any of the king side pieces yet. Uh, bishop e7, breaking the pin. So I'm playing a bit more kind of standard classical chess, and he's trying to be very creative. Uh, bishop d3, knight bd7, and now he plays another very aggressive move, f4. Anyone see the threat for white? What does white want to play next move? Yes. f5. f5. Oh, bishop. Yeah, simply trapping the bishop. So yeah, not only is he gaining space, but he has a, a one move tactical threat. And already, I have to be careful. And there's not too many moves which defend against f5. So let me pose the question. Black to move and not lose a piece. Arjun. Knight b6. Knight b6, very good. Me too. You too, knight b6. Uh, creating room for the bishop to retreat. Mm -hmm. And now, if, uh, yeah, if f5, then I would play just probably bishop d7 or bishop c8. Um, but he continues. He played knight f3. And now I played a very tricky move. I played queen d6. And the point behind queen d6 is it's to discourage f5. Because if he plays f5, what move could I play? You could um, play g3 and fork the. Yeah, I could play queen g3, right? So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm trying to prevent him from expanding further. But then he, he very much surprised me and played f5 anyway showing no fear. And sometimes this is how you end up beating a much stronger player, is you put them in a situation where if they over push, you might, uh, you might get some counterattack. And that's exactly what happened. This game, white has very much over pushed the king side and has left himself with some holes. And I thought some, for some time here, because I wasn't sure if queen g3 leads to much, but, um, but after some thought, I went ahead I played queen g3, and I, uh, I forced him to kind of give up his casting rights. And now, um, as king has to move, he played king d2. I think he's trying to run away to the queen side. And now, now let me ask you guys, black to move, how would you continue? Yes. G2. Queen G2. Check. Um, yeah, Queen G2 is interesting. I think the problem with Queen G2 is after Queen E2, white is pretty much forcing a queen trade. And this is a general rule in chess. Whenever you're attacking your opponent's king, or whenever your, your opponent's king is less safe, you don't want to trade queens. So moves like Queen G2 or Queen F2, aren't necessarily great for black, because it probably allows a queen trade. Uh, let me help you guys out. Like 94, yes. Maybe I don't need to help you guys out. 94. Um, when you're attacking, you want to attack with me as many pieces as possible. So this just brings another piece into the attack. Um, I, I couldn't necessarily just play 94 quickly, because it's very complicated. Um, after 94, there's a lot going on in the position. Two pieces are attacking e4. My pawn's defending e4. Our bishops are now staring at each other. My bishop on e6 is still hanging. His king is still very centralized on d2. Knight's gone to c4. I have knight c4 possibilities, maybe bishop b4 later possibilities. I still have my queen check possibilities. So it's a very, very messy and chaotic position. And this is another way people beat stronger players, or another way upsets occur, is when the position is very chaotic, 
it's sometimes difficult to navigate your way through the chaos. Even if you're a grandmaster, it's still maybe more likely that you'll make a mistake in this position as whites. So um, as we'll see, it was pretty complicated to a point where he did blunder uh, eventually. Um, first, he takes on e4. I tick. He takes with bishop. So now some d dust has settled, but, um, but the position has opened up now. There's some more lines for my pieces. And now I play queen f, or no. Whoop. This should be before check was not played. Queen f2 check was played. I don't know why that was saved. Um, queen f2. Uh, attacking the king and leaving white with not too many moves. Um, I want to take a poll here as white, because white has, if I'm counting correctly, four legal moves. Um, I want you guys to think for at least 30 seconds, and then decide on one move that you would play as white. You don't have to raise your hand now. I'll go through each move. Who votes queen e2 for white? Anyone? One vote. Two votes. Three votes. OK. Four votes for queen e2. OK. Uh, who votes king d3? No one. Who votes king c3? No one. Who votes king c1? One vote, two vote, three votes. I think some people voted twice. Yeah. Um, turns out there's only one good move for white in this position. The only good move for white is king c1, which he didn't play. Um, let's go through the other losing moves, which, uh, one of which he did play. Um, queen e2 loses to bishop to, or not bishop e4, knight to c4 check. Uh, taking advantage of the fact that king is the only piece defending the queen. And after king d1, I could then take on b2 check, king d2, bishop b4 check. And now I'm controlling all these squares. I'm forcing the king to move away from, uh, from the lady, and I'll take on e2 next move. So queen e2 loses by, by force. The move he played was probably one of the worst moves in the position, king c3. Yeah. And that's one thing which kind of goes without saying. You should not develop your king in the opening, especially with queens on the board. And um, in chess, we think that the king is a strong piece, but really the king is a baby. You want to protect your baby. And for some reason, uh, I guess he forgot his very basic principles. Or maybe he thought his king was, for some reason, safe on, on c3. So now it's, black. it's, it's black's move. Um, Arjun, do you have a suggestion? Bishop b4. I was going to ask you guys black's move, but I think Arjun already found it. Bishop b4. Do you agree? Bishop b4, yeah. Um, Which brings out the king farther and farther. Exactly. You're just dragging the king up the board. And it took, me, it took me a few minutes before I played bishop e4. I saw it right away, but I, I had to make sure that, uh, that all the variations won for black. So I played bishop e4, and he actually just resigned immediately. He didn't even test me to see if, uh, if I could finish off the game. So let's see what, what, what would happen if, uh, if he takes a bishop. Um, first of all, king d3 is, uh, runs into bishop c4 mate. So king take b4. How does black continue? Um, yes. Queen take b2. Queen take b2, very good. And now white is left with a few options, all of which are bad. Queen b3 loses a queen. King a5 gets mated. So the only other move would be king c5. Black to move. Queen a3. Queen a3 is mate. Now, I'm not sure if I would have played this. Maybe I would see queen a3 mate, but I think a bit more funny is queen b5, forcing the king further up the board. And at this point, it's just embarrassing for white. And he probably resigned because he didn't castle. want to get embarrassed like this. Like castle. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe there's some line where I could castle with mate. But um, like knight c8, get the king to c7, 
And then I could play around with him, but uh, queen b6 mate is, uh, is simple enough. So it's embarrassing to have your king walk all the way up the board and you're a grandmaster and you lose in, um, in under 20 moves. But, um, but hopefully this gives you some inspiration, gives you some more, um, more hope. If you, if you do play a grandmaster, they're not invincible and they, they can make huge mistakes too. So in this case, I think uh, maybe he was just unfocused for, for a move or maybe he was just not in the right mindset, but that stuff does happen. And when it does happen, you want to be thankful, thankful for it because it doesn't happen too often. I have some opening, like some very nice games and openings that I've prepared. I'm going to give you a choice between two openings. We can either look on the white side where white plays e4 first move, or we can look on the black side, black playing against d4. So I'm going to show you two or three games in the same opening. And this is an opening I learned a few years ago, and I played it with some success in tournaments, and I played it with a lot of success online. It's a great blitz opening and it is a gambit. So d4, knight f6, c4, e5. This is a Budapest gambit. And at first, when I was first kind of learning this, I thought it was way too risky, looks very weird that you just give up a center pawn for seemingly no reason. But um, the more I looked at it, the more I realized that black has a lot of uh, interesting resources. So. So the main move, yeah, is take the pawn, and then black will respond with knight to g4. And now you're attacking the pawn, and there's a lot of lines where you accelerate your development. So the first game I'm going to show you is actually the game which inspired me to play this opening for black. And it's a very straightforward game. Um, almost all of black's moves are very intuitive. Uh, white will typically defend the pawn. Black will, er, black will continue attacking the pawn. White will defend. And black has this check on b4. Uh, white will usually play knight d2. And now we attack the pawn one more time with queen e7. And now black is already winning back the pawn by force. There's no way for white to defend the pawn. Yeah, so white, uh, white normally plays this move a3 attempt to counterattack against the bishop. And now, very cool move from black. Uh, any suggestions? What would you do as black in this position? Yes? Uh, something like take. Something like take. <laughs> take what? You can take a lot of things. Take the knight. Take the knight. OK, bishop take knight. Do you agree? Bishop take knight. Bishop take knight is a normal move. But there's a, a much more creative move here. And actually, the, the best move and the, the coolest move is knight take e5. Which confuses a lot of people at first because the bishop is still hanging. And let's say white takes the bishop. Arjun. Knight takes knight d3. Knight to d3, yes. Smothered mate. Kind of out of nowhere. Just checkmate after eight moves. So amazingly enough, um, according to Mega Database, there's been 53 games after A take B4, all of which ended with knight D3 mate. Happened in Olympia? One of the games happened in the Olympiad. It was one of the players on the Indonesian women's team. Um, one of her very first tournaments, she, uh, she was white. She, she took the bait on B4 and then really got punished for it after knight d3. Um, so this is a cool line, not only for, uh, for black to win very quickly, but you always uh, have to kind of learn from this concept where if your opponent looks like they're giving you a free piece, you want to make sure that you're very careful before you, you take it. So there's, there's other lines, too, where the same concept applies. So uh, one, uh, maybe a couple more things about this line. Um, of course, black, or of course, white should not take the bishop. Uh, a lot of times, white will take on e5. And then what's interesting, black can, again, take back and ignore the bishop, because again, pawn take bishop, knight d3 mates. 
And then if white takes on e5, black will then take on d2, take on d2, queen take e5. And it's a very reasonable position for black. I would probably prefer black here just with the centered queen. So any questions about this? It's a very quick game. And it's a game you should know by heart, because if 53 people fell into the exact same trap, odds are more people will in the future. Question? Let's say with a knight, knight uh, c3. Oh, knight c3. Instead of, yeah. Instead of d2. Yeah. That's, that's a good segue into the next game. Uh, because uh, you can't do the same trap. Yeah, you, you, yeah. Can't do, yeah. you can't do queen e7, a3, knight take e5. This doesn't work because the knight has to be on d2. Yeah. So let's go on to the next game. Uh, Is Rubenstein as white against Vidmar? Anyone here of Rubenstein? Rubenstein? Pretty famous player. Um, Rubenstein, yeah. Um, he lived in the early 1900s, uh, one of the top players in the world. He lost in a very quick game against the Budapest. So we'll see that game. And he was, yeah, he was white, and he played knight c3. And after knight c3, uh, what I recommend for black and what Vidmar played was queen e7. Just you want to win the pawn. Yeah. Rubenstein defended the pawn with queen d5. Now it's a bit trickier, because you actually don't win back the pawn by force. Uh, but black still gets some counterplay. So black took, take. And now a very aggressive move from black, queen a3. Oh, I was thinking of that. Take, take, get Yeah, great minds think alike. So. Queen a3 attacks the c-pawn and poses some questions for white. Uh, what happened was rook to c1, defending the c-pawn. And now black has uh, a couple options. Black could take on a2, but then the queen is in somewhat of a precarious situation, and there's still, there's still some issues for black. For example, white could play h3, and then the knight becomes very uh, misplaced. So instead of taking on a2, black played a much better move. Black played f6. Forcing the pawn to, uh, to either capture or threatening to take on e5 next. So white took on f6, black takes back. And black is now down a pawn, because we've, we've traded off the pawn that, uh, that white had had on e5. Um, but even though black is down a pawn, there's some counterplay for it. There's some compensation. And the good thing about being down a pawn is that you have uh, more open files to work with. Now the F file and the E file are open for black. And we'll see how this plays a role uh, later in the game. Question? No, You're just stretching. OK. Uh, queen d2, d6, defending c7. And now white played knight d4. Looks like a very reasonable move. Um, the better move for white was queen e3 check, which looks very strange. But um, it, it gives some problems for the black king. And for white players who might be playing against the Budapest, uh, this is a very good looking line for white if, uh, if white knows this move queen e3. But that's not what happened. Knight d4 was played. Castle, e3, very standard. And from this point forward, every move that black plays for the rest of the game has some threat to it. Um, first move, very simple, it's capture, capture. And now black continues the initiative with knight e4. And now there's some problems for white because the queen has to move off the diagonal. And wherever the queen goes, queen a5 check or queen b4 check will come. And white will lose casting rights. And that's what happened. Queen c2, queen a5. And now the king is forced to move. White can't block the check. And even though white's still up a pawn, uh, the position becomes very favorable for black. So white played king e2. Um, yeah, let me, let me ask you guys. What would you play as black in this position? Raise your hand if you think you, uh, you have a suggestion. Maybe bishop. Bishop f5? Do you agree? Bishop f5? 
Bishop f5 is probably the most natural move. Develop the bishop to maybe pressure the queen. Uh, Vidmar played something a bit stronger and a bit more creative. Uh, what he does is he sacrifices. Plays rook take f4. You saw that. You saw that, OK. Um, what it does is it removes one of white's best pieces and one of white's best defenders. Uh, the bishop on f4 was really one of the only developed pieces. So Vidmar gets rid of it so he can continue uh, with his attack. So white has to take, and then bishop f5. And now uh, the e-file has opened, and bishop f5 has its own threats, um, mainly knight g3, threatening to win the queen. So white is in a very precarious situation. Uh, white played queen b2. I think the next move for black is very straightforward. Rook e8. And yeah, again, black is threatening some very nasty discoveries. Uh, again, mainly knight g3. So white pretty much has to move the king. And really, the only reasonable square is king f3. And again, we see the king developing before the other pieces, usually not the best sign, uh, especially at the, beginning, at the beginning of the game. Um, but OK, black still now, now has to prove the, uh, the attack. And any ideas for black in this, in this position? How can black keep the initiative going? Um, could he play queen uh, uh, d2 off from the second place and attack him to us? You said queen d2. Uh, yeah, off of the trade. So unfortunately, queen d2 is not what you want to do because it's trading queens. Yeah. And when queens come off the board, the king becomes a bit safer. And yeah, maybe black has still some initiative, but um, you're not going to end up mating anytime soon. So it's funny. You found the right square, but the wrong piece. You should put your knight on d2. Knight d2? The, the only other move, knight d2, yeah. Uh, attacking the king, forcing the king to, uh, to progress further. Uh, king g3 was played. And now something really kind of strange and interesting happened. Black repeated. Black played knight e4. And what white should have done was repeat and play king back to f3. But that's not what white did. And what, what white did was play king h4 and then OK, we can say stupid, yes. Uh, then the game ended very easily for black. Rook e6 was played. And now the king is well, very short on squares. Rook h6 is coming. Uh, that king is trapped. And the game ended after rook h6, bishop h5. And don't forget about your queen on a5, because it can also help participate in the attack. And there, OK, there's a lot of winning moves here, but the most forcing is rook take h5, and then yeah, uh, bishop g6, and white resigned after king h4, queen h5 mates. So this is a very nice game to know by heart, because I think uh, both sides played pretty intuitive moves until black started sacrificing uh, in a pretty crazy manner to, uh, to continue the attack. And if we go back a bit further, I'll show you guys what would have happened if white repeated? Because um, it turns out that knight d2 was not actually the best move. If knight d2 were, um, or if, if uh, okay, knight d2 was played, and after king g3, if king f3 uh, was was played, um, black would have to find a different move, because black would not be satisfied with the draw here, especially with white's king so exposed. So the strongest move for black in this position is to play h5. Very simply threatening bishop g4. And I think white would have lost uh, pretty quickly. Um, and I'll show you an example line. Mm -hmm. So g3, g3 is possible. Um, g3 might run into knight d2, though. Look at this, knight d2. King g2, bishop, e4 check. That's so good. Looks pretty good for black. 
h3 is another try, uh, preventing bishop g4. And then black plays h4. Very cool move, actually. h4 is a hard move to find if you don't see the idea. Uh, what h4 does is it threatens uh, basically a forced win. So let's say white doesn't see the threat and plays some move like bishop e2. Black to move and win. Arjun. Knight d2. Oh, knight d2 actually wins as well. Um, yeah, knight d2 wins. I didn't see that. Uh, even cooler is queen a3. Because after queen take a3, then you mate on d2. But yeah, knight d2 or queen a3. Uh, so the best move for white instead of bishop e2 is to defend and to play g4, giving the king some square to run back. And then black can continue, knight d2, king g2. And now we see a similar line, bishop e4, king g1, knight f3. You guys know what a windmill is? In, in real life, but also in chess. Yes? Um, a windmill, yeah, is basically when you have uh, continual discovered checks and you can move back and, and win material. So this is one example of a windmill where uh, white's king is pretty much stuck after whatever check black gives, for example, knight d4, king g1, knight back to f3, king g2. Um, now, unfortunately for black, there's no more material to win, but this is just a completely crushing position for black. Um, there's probably no need to, if black wanted, you could probably play knight d2 and then take the rook. Um, but even stronger would be just some move like queen c5. And white's just completely paralyzed. So this whole line, uh, especially after white lost casting rights, was, was very, very bad. And uh, black, uh, black definitely got the better of, of white in this, uh, in this variation. Any questions? OK, I'm going to show one more Budapest game, just to give you even more inspiration to play the Budapest. And then, um, then if we have time, we'll, uh, we'll finish off with one fun game. So let's go back. And let me see if you guys just remember. Let's test your memory. So Budapest, uh, what move in this position for black? Yeah, shout out. E5, e5. tick. Knight g4. knight g4, very good. Um, let's say knight f3. Last time we saw bishop f4, let's say knight f3. Do you guys know the best move for black in this position? Knight c6. Knight c6 is possible, and knight c6 would probably just transpose into the other line after bishop f4. Nothing wrong with this. Um, I would argue that there's a stronger move for black. Arjun? F6. F6, not necessary. You don't want to trade off the pawn too soon. Arjun again. Queen Sorry? Queen e7. Queen e7. There's a stronger move. Bishop c5. Bishop c5. You take advantage of the fact that the bishop has not yet developed. And you can play bishop c5. Essentially forcing e3. And after e3, now the bishop is sort of passive on, on c1. Make sense? Yes. Um, and then we continue. Play knight c6. Uh, white will normally just give up trying to save the pawn. If white does try and be greedy and hold on to the pawn, we have queen e7. And then there, there's no way to win the pawn back. So usually white will play bishop e2. You recapture on e5. And now it's a pretty standard position. Um, but I wanted to show you one more game, uh, at least from this position, because if you play the Budapest, you might get this a lot, and, or at least a structure a lot. And there's a very cool idea, which doesn't happen in too many openings, but happens in this, uh, in this variation in particular. So castle, castle, nothing cool yet. Knight c3, rook e8. Now a3. And now what move seems like a good move for black in this position? What move would you guys play? And that's actually a good kind of thought process. If it's white to move, white wants to play b4. So how do you stop it? A5. A5, very good. And it's funny, because a5, there's actually two reasons why black plays this move. 
The most obvious reason is to, of course, stop B4. The less obvious reason is, is uh, something we'll see. Yeah, Arjun? That's four on your side? Um, maybe, but uh, there's, e there's a better reason. So you'll see very shortly, don't worry. B3. So now black plays a very surprising move. You said B6? Mm, possible, but not quite. Yes? Rook A6. Rook A6. And if, if you look at the games of beginners, a lot of beginners like to develop their rooks very quickly like this. Uh, but in this position, it, this works out very nicely because a whole six rank is open for black. Black hasn't committed any pawns on the six rank, so the rook can swing over and help out for a kingside attack. And um, it's actually very hard for white to, to deal with because um, okay, what, what happened in the game I'll show you is bishop b2 was played. It's completing development. Rook h6. Now the rook, the queen can also come in. Uh, the bishop can also help participate. And all of a sudden, black has a lot of pieces with the uh, potential to attack on the king side. And white doesn't have too many defenders on the king side. So the game uh, I'm showing you, um, black won fairly quickly. And two masters were playing the game. Who, whose names I forget, so we'll find out once, uh, once the final move is played. White played h3, trying to slow down some of black's attack, but h3 actually gives black a target to, uh, to focus on. Black simply plays d6. And now there's ideas of sacrificing the bishop. And white plays knight e4. Looks like a, a reasonable move, but black doesn't care. Black takes on h3. And I think this is just incredibly strong because once white's king opens up, then there's going to be a lot of lines to attack on, a lot of uh, mating ideas. So in the game, white took on c5. The dumbest move. The dumbest move? Why? Because then you, then you have, uh, it's made in two. It's made in two? Mm, maybe not quite, but what would you play as black? Bishop takes g2. Yeah, bishop takes g2. I was very close to me. Bishop take g2, and white just lost both of his pawns, which were the, really the only things defending the king. And now it's just a party for black on the king side with the queen coming to h4, the rook already on h6. And that's one of the powerful things about this opening. You've, you've made what was your most passive piece on a8 one of your best attacking pieces. So bishop take e5 was played, and then black simply plays queen h4. Very straightforward mate, mate, mate threat. Uh, queen h1 is coming. White played f4, and now queen g3. And white resigned. Uh, the game was, I guess, uh, Reitz against leg key. Um, I guess white may have been unrated, but black was 24 over 2,400. So um, as we can see, white, white sort of played like, naturally, but got absolutely smashed after this rook a6, rook h6 maneuver. So if any of you are considering playing this opening, or even if you're not looking to play the Budapest, it's still good to kind of accumulate these types of ideas, because they do uh, kind of come up in other openings too. So any questions about this game? I wanted to show you guys a game which I played many, many years ago, probably when I was around Arjun's age. Um, I was like in fourth or fifth grade, and I played at the National Scholastic Tournament. It was actually the National Elementary School Championships. And back during that time, I had a coach, uh, pretty well-known coach, Tamara Golovi, a uh, Russian trainer. She coached players like Yuri Shulman, Boris Gelfand. And when I was working with her, uh, she gave me a notebook. How tall was her name? Tamara Golovi? Golovi. Golovi, yeah. Um, and the way we worked on openings, we, uh, we kept a notebook of all my openings. And we would write them down, move by move. These days, it's much easier. Just you can save all your openings to chess base. But back then, uh, we had a notebook of all, all the lines that I played. 
for white and for black. And she would sometimes just give me like simple variations, but sometimes she would give me games. And there was one game she gave me for the white side, which uh, I learned with her when I first started uh, taking lessons from her. And after a few years um, of kind of knowing the line and playing the line, um, I actually played through the full game that she gave me. And I won without really having to think. All I had to do was recall what was in the notebook. So I'll show you that game. Um, I was white. I won in about, I forgot the exact move count, but it was around 18 moves. And it was pretty, it's a pretty beautiful line because white sacrifices a lot of material for a mating attack. So I play e4. Any e4 players here? Yeah. One, eight. two, three, four. OK. Um, it's King's Pawn, and we go into a pretty well-known line, Italian. I play the Giocco Piano, Pawn C3. Do you have a question? Yeah. White can actually decide whether it's more going to be a, a solid game. I wouldn't call it passive, but white can play solidly, or white can play very aggressively. So a solid move here would be D3. And we see these days a lot of grandmasters are playing this. They, they like to be solid. But the more aggressive move and the move that I played is d4. And we call this the molar attack. Because um, what ends up happening is white actually sacrifices a pawn for increased initiative and increased attack. Um, my opponent took. I took. He plays bishop e4 check. Now if we see, I'm in check. And my e4 pawn is hanging. So. I just I was playing the moves that I recalled. I played knight to c3. My opponent takes on e4, and we get into this position, which was it was kind of the starting position in my notebook. And um, this position, yeah, white loses a pawn, doesn't win it back by force, but simply castles. And tries to take advantage of the fact that white's king or that black's king is still in the center. Um, so now my opponent fell into a uh, pretty well-known trap. He took on c3 twice. He started with, uh, with knight takes c3. I play pawn takes c3. He plays bishop takes c3. So now white's down two pawns. And, um, and the rook is hanging. What to do for white? Arjun. Bishop a3 is one move, yeah. Have you seen this before? And I believe bishop a3 is considered to be the best move at least according to the computer. But there's a different move. Yeah? Queen e2 is a move, uh, but not the move that I played. Uh, the move that I played is queen b3. It's forgetting about the rook on a1 and going after the f7 pawn. Um, so black took the, the rook. Why not? Free material. So now black is up a rook and two pawns, if I'm counting correctly. But for the rest of the game, I'm going to have a uh, very dangerous attack against the king. I take on f7, king f8. And now, now it's a matter of, con of continuing the initiative for white. Um, I start with bishop to g5, almost trapping the queen. Knight has to move back to e7. Now the next move is a very, very important move for, uh, for white to play. Um, any ideas how to continue in this position for white? 95. Anyone agree? 95? Um, yeah. 95 is by far the best move. For a few reasons. First of all, it, um, yeah, it, uh, it aims to control the f7 square one more time. It also opens up the f3 square for the queen. So this is a move I played. And I should note, like when I was playing this game, I was Young kid, I, I knew all these moves already, um, so there was really nothing for me to, to think about. But as I was playing the game, I was taking a few minutes on each move just to try and make it seem like I hadn't known the line before. So I, I was trying to get my opponent to kind of underestimate my play. So kind of an interesting psychological trick. Um, yeah, black, uh, my, my opponent thought for a little bit and then grabbed more material, takes on d4. <laughs> So yeah, sometimes, I guess it, it depends how much you want to trick your opponent. But um, in this case, I, uh, I decided to be a bit more tricky. 
Um, so bishop take d4, and now uh, the move which I heard some people say, bishop g6. This is simply a clearance tactic. The bishop doesn't want to be on f7. The queen wants to be on f7. So I simply move the bishop away. And because both the knight and the bishop are still controlling the square, black can't take either piece. If black takes the knight, queen f7 mate. If black takes the bishop, queen f7 mate. Make sense? So neither piece can be taken. But my opponent didn't give up. He saw this, and he played d5, blocking the queen. But now I play queen f3 check. And yeah, it's looking pretty bad for black. All my pieces swarming around the king. And um, OK, it ended very shortly. My opponent played bishop f5. I simply take the bishop. It's not really a check, but um, it sets up a lot of discoveries against the king. Um, my opponent took the knight. So OK, black is now up a rook in two pawns. But it doesn't matter at all, because after bishop e6, white's completely winning. My opponent uh, gave up a, a bit quicker. He played king e8, and I played queen f7 mate. Black could try and survive, but uh, it's not going to be too hopeful. After bishop f6, I would just take. And if take, it would be the same mate. So this is why it pays off to, uh, to remember kind of quick miniature games, because sometimes uh, your opponent will stumble into a line like this unknowingly, and you can win a quick game without having to think really at all. So any questions? Uh, I'm going to show you one very, very quick uh, kind of miniature just to cap things off. Uh, it's a fun one, and I'm going to jump straight through to the very final position. This is called Breaking the Rules, and just going to zoom through the opening. Um, e4, it was a king's gambit, and I was black. This was a blitz game I played many years ago, and it ended with kind of a, a funny idea. So what happened is black was down a pawn, but I had some early initiative, as we saw in a lot of these games. My opponent played bishop d2. I took on c3, and then White played a, a bad move here. He was trying to be tricky. He should have taken with the bishop or with the pawn, but instead he played queen e2 check. And this is a game I've shown to a lot of people over the years. Um, a lot of people have a hard time finding the best move here for black, but I'll leave it up to you guys. Black to move and play the best move. You're in check. You can't take the bishop. Arjun. Sorry? King d7, best move. Amazingly enough, I can develop my king. It's a, another clearance tactic, threatening rook e8, winning the queen. Problem for white is he has no time to recapture the bishop on c3, because I'm threatening rook e8. So if bishop take, rook e8 wins the queen. So my opponent played queen g4, check, Arjun. King c6. Bringing the king out into the open, but, um, but again, the queen's attacked. He has no time to take my bishop. And black wins a piece by developing the king. Uh, then the game ended very quickly. I'll just show you the next few moves. Uh, queen f3 was played. I take. He takes. And then I played queen f6. And the game ended very soon. It turns out that white's king is probably more exposed than black's king, because there's threats of both queen take f4 and queen take b2. So the game didn't last too much longer. So I thought this was a nice way to end the lecture, because the first game we saw, white developed the king, got punished for it. This time, black develops the king and gets rewarded for it. So hopefully, these games inspire you to play some um, enterprising, aggressive, and creative chess. And I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, have a good night.